GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, joined by my co-host Kyle Reedhead, and we believe that blockchain gaming is going to change the world. That's why we're carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. There's been a lot of hype around Parallel uh, as of late, which is one of the bigger, I guess, Web3 not one of the biggest Web3 games, but one of the most like well-known, I think, at the moment, just especially going through the media, et cetera. And this episode did not disappoint. It was uh, learning about what Parallel has done. One is just like refreshing to see someone build and, and execute on what they said they're going to build and just like consistently do this in an open, transparent, but also just like ship and ship and ship and ship. And they've just done an incredible job so far. And they're really like carving a path on you know how to build a Web3 game. Um, so really cool there. We get into their next game that they're building called Colony, which is just the most mind-blowing thing ever, which is including NFTs and blockchain, but also AI. And this, you'll see, if you're watching on YouTube anyway, you'll see mine and Jay's eyes just go huge. And we're just like, whoa, what are you building right now? So this was uh, a mind-blowing episode from all angles, everything. Just so impressive. Yeah, you got to stick around to the end to learn about Colony because the way they are building a game where you can interact and influence an AI avatar that then acts autonomously from you. So he's playing, your AI avatar is playing the game without you and earning and creating digital assets that are built on chain and then selling and buying those. I mean, it's just wild to hear these stories of what is happening in this game, which is really creating potentially an entirely new category for gaming and Kalos talks about his mission there and why he believes that and how his sort of upbringing playing games led him to this point and the whole team yeah just an unbelievable episode and really a great example of a few things one how do you build in order to bring not just web3 people into an ecosystem in a game but also normies Kalosh talks about how they're doing that. So you don't need to use blockchain in order to play this game, but then you can use blockchain. And what the way you present blockchain to people is the key of what makes that decision point of whether they want to take that next step. And he talks about how they do that. It's really clever and really creative and that it'll, it will give you that inflection point of, oh, I could have made money if I was doing this, or I could have owned assets in this game which i could then buy or sell or trade like very very powerful the way that they're building this and also just amazing because as kai said hot you know really like one of the hottest brands in web3 right now but still in closed beta so yeah i mean there were two hundred thousand on the wait list currently investment from you know paradigm investment from the founder of youtube like it's, it's a big deal what Parallel is doing. And um, and obviously the community, since they've launched, they're in beta right now, but those who are playing it and are using it are like, this game is amazing. So they've just done a, an incredible job all across the board. And so this episode was, well, how do they do it? What are they doing? What tech stack are they building on? What are the limitations that they've had? Um, what are they expecting in the future? So it was like, if you're in the gaming world, if you're building in gaming, but also just if you're building on blockchain, this is just an incredible episode to just like from a founder who's doing it and still doing it, uh, who's done it and is still doing it. It's um, there's just a lot of good insights, I think, from from how he's building parallel. Mm -hmm. And Kalosh's background is so strong that, as you mentioned, it's not his first startup. You know, he spent 11 years in TradFi working at TD Bank, Kai, one of mm -hmm. Canada's largest banks. He also spent many years in consumer mobile tech. He was the CEO of Buns, which you probably don't know Buns if you're outside of, I don't even know if Buns is outside of Canada, but basically a leading online marketplace for buying, selling, and trading goods in the physical world. Uh, so he has this really strong background in consumer tech, and he talks about how he has transferred that knowledge over to Parallel. And as you mentioned, Kai, they raised $50 million from Paradigm at a $500 million valuation two years ago. I can only imagine mm. where they're at now and where they're going to go with their next raise. You know, we're talking about one of you know one of the, the businesses in the space that really has the potential to onboard a lot of people and to be 
you know, you were guessing a billion. Why didn't you? I I, I, I didn't want billion. <laughs> you got nervous. You got I got nervous. I got scared. I got scared. Onboarding a billion is not easy, man. Not but easy. this episode is going to teach you how. So make sure you check yeah. it all out, and then stick around for the end to just be completely mind blown about the thing they're building that's going to onboard eight billion people. Uh, <laughs> but before we do that, let's take a second to hear from our sponsors. Modern newsletters are built on Paragraph. That's right. Paragraph is a brand new newsletter platform that combines the best parts of Web 2 and Web 3 to supercharge newsletters for both writers and readers. Build a community, not just an audience. Paragraph uses blockchain tech to allow readers to collect and own the words that matter to them. This takes reading a newsletter to the next level. With Paragraph, readers can mint, collect, and show off quotes from their favorite newsletters. This opens new possibilities like creators sharing revenue with fans. I also love their new feature, Paragraph AI. This integrates GPT-4 natively in Paragraph to create, edit, and improve your writing effortlessly with one click. And guess what? We at Web3 Academy are on board and have already moved our content over to Paragraph. We believe this is the future of newsletters because of the profound engagement it creates between creators and fans. So whether you're a creator, writer, or an avid reader, it's time to check out Paragraph and capitalize on the opportunity of being early. GM, Carlos, welcome to Web3 Academy. So excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, happy to be here. First off, huge congrats, man. Congrats to you and the entire team you've really taken Web3 by storm over the past month with the closed beta of Parallel TCG launching. Amazing that a closed beta is getting so much hype. I know you've got over 200,000 people that have signed up that are trying to get access to the beta, but not everybody is able to get access right now as you figure out how to basically scale and build this game to millions, which is really why we're so excited to have you on today. First, I just want to ask, Neither you nor your founders come from a gaming background, yet you've built such a successful game. H- how have you done that? Yeah, I mean, we come from you know c- consumer tech and blockchain, so we built a number of different things, but games in specific are new to us in terms of building them. Obviously, a lot of us play a lot of different games. The game was designed by Koji Nagata, and he's the head of gaming with Connor and Carson and on his team as well as a number of others who contributed to it. But yeah, I mean, we just, you know, it's relatively new for us to not build consumer tech, but focus on an actual game Um, that comes with its own unique new learnings. And so some of the stuff is applicable that we did in the past. And then there's a whole like kind of net new category that we're still learning about and kind of making adjustments to factor the game in a way that we feel like is going to set it up for scale and success in the future. It was kind of a, something that we really thought we wanted to do and we've just learned as much as as fast as we can and as much as we can along the way and what was it that made you want to jump into blockchain gaming you mentioned that you grew up playing games and i know i've heard your co-founders say the same that you guys were all big gamers as kids your experience coming from sort of mobile consumer apps and consumer tech you know you could have could have gone a lot of different directions. You also have your background in finance. How did that first sort of, yeah, let's do this moment happen? Trading card games aren't really trading card games anymore. Like they're like, they're CCGs, right? Like you can't really trade any of your cards in these digital games. That was part of the fun of it all as a kid. And I think we just started to talk about what we, like how the technology can actually be used to make the game more fun. And Try not to shoehorn it into places it didn't make sense, but try to make it such that the ecosystem could make a lot, you know, be more fun than it, with the technology than without it. So I think ultimately, as we looked at what was possible with smart contracts and our experience in that space, we wanted to find opportunities where we could make a game better um, as a result of it. And like, you know, no one really publicizes a game being like, this is an Amazon web services game. Like no one does that. It's so like... You shouldn't really, it's just a game. And if it's good, it's good, right? The technology is like a facilitator of scale or utility or X, Y, and Z. And so I think we tried to approach it as pragmatically as possible, which is like, how do we start off by creating a world we really think is compelling? 
a game that can be really compelling and can use this technology in a way that adds utility that it wouldn't otherwise be able to you know have like i think the question we try to ask ourselves is like what's uniquely possible with this technology and how do we demonstrate that in a way that everyone can understand and say this is fun and this is cool you you're stealing my question here oh did, did I? <laughs> that's my next question so before we jump into tcg parallel tcg and also we want to talk about colony then sort of next game that you guys are building, which involves AI as well. Let's just take a, a step back. What is it about the tech that does make gaming better? It's in the way you implement the technology that can like really offer new kind of paradigms or facets to how games work. The best way to like articulate my thoughts on, on this is like, games are a really great non-threatening delivery mechanism for change <laughs> in technology. Right. Like it's like they're fun and like it just it, it kind of passively allows you to do things that are like you're not the consequences of having earned something in a game are much more lighthearted, but you're still learning that things can exist in a scarce, a scarce way as a result of like blockchain. And so like you're kind of learning this stuff passively by playing this game this and being involved in this world or IP that you really like. But really, ultimately, you're kind of benefiting by learning how the technology works in this maybe a way that seems to have a little less consequence it feels like because it is a game so i think there's this beautiful marriage between games and blockchain because of that like non like that kind of like fun fun element of things but some of the stuff that obviously like really matters right is just the ability to own your assets and 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 have that be you know immutable and that comes with its own problems right too like people lose their wallets people lose their keys and then their cards go missing or people click on a contract and something unfortunate happens so it's just like this way to start learning about something, right? a new technology, or relatively new technology. I wouldn't say it's new exactly anymore, but just to interact with it in a way that like isn't like buy, sell, buy, sell. It's more just like play game and, oh, I got a cool card or, oh, I'm going to be able to make another card. And so I think the more we can install fun into the experience of interacting with this stuff and the more we can really clearly articulate why it, it it's beneficial like i think a, one thing we don't do very well is like say why it makes sense and, and so when it comes to like parallels to tcg like one of the reasons it makes sense is like you can't own your cards and one your cards can't have scarcity as a tcg without digitally without blockchain so just like solves a problem and two is like you can transact them with other people just like you could in elementary school and trade your pokemon cards trade your magic cards or whatever it is and so i think we try to approach it as much as humanly possible from like a, just a really practical standpoint, which is like, what is uniquely possible as a result of this technology? And let's do that. And let's make that as simple and clear as possible from a com communication and product standpoint so that everyone can do it and everyone can understand the benefit. I really like that you bring up uh, this idea of it being a non-threatening or like an easy on-ramp because that is that's something we've been talking about for a while in the view that I think that everybody in the space has always has been saying, hey, gaming is going to be the thing that onboards the next billion, right? It's always up there with like the top potential onboarding ramps. And I know that you guys, and we'll talk about this later, I don't want to dive into this yet, but you know that you guys have built the game so that you don't have to participate in the blockchain side of it. You can actually come in without participating in that. And then if you want to move over to the blockchain side, you can do that. So I think that's really amazing the way you've built that. I also know that you, when you were younger and gaming, you were selling skins yourself, yeah. right? And like, yeah. how did you sell skins back in the 90s? It was the way it came about was there was a guy in Sarsich tribes that I didn't know him in real life. It was a tribes was like a pretty popular, like kind of third person shooter type game that was like the first multiplayer online kind of like Halo. And there was a guy who taught me how to extract the different skins and then implement them on different in, on two different characters and i started to kind of use that at, to my advantage to kind of build clout within this very large tribe it was like a clan and i be ended up becoming the leader of the tribe and i ended up disbanding the tribe because i was like 12 years old right being like oh yeah i'm gonna this like i didn't take it over and disband it literally i did disband the largest tribe the largest <laughs> clan after i got leadership role but i was really just like interacting with people and they would be like, how do you have that skin? And like, I would explain to them and I would just like say like, oh, send me like whatever, $2 on PayPal and I'll give it to you. 
but yeah, like I think from coming back to what you were saying earlier, the TCG, right? Like you can come in and play the game for free. It's a free to play game. You don't need to own cards. You don't need to own ERC20 Prime, which is the reward token from the ecosystem. You can just come in and play. And but every time you win a match, you're met with this screen that says you would have won X amount of Prime. And there's you know battle pass rewards that at the end of a season you'll have a choice if you want to mint them or not. And so really like the thing we're trying to do is to say like play this game and if you want to see the value of blockchain, you, you can choose to mint this thing or not. And if you choose not to, you'll probably watch other people be like, oh, it's worth money five seasons from now. And I should have minted it. So like the best way to demonstrate the value of this technology is to give people the choice in it, let them either choose for it or against it. If they choose not to, that's okay, but they're probably going to pay attention to that same card in a couple of months when you know, you're on season five or something and be like, oh, I didn't realize it was so rare and I should have minted it. And it'll click. The first time they'll be like, I get it. It's scarce. It's maintained that supply and it's tradable and mine's not because I chose not to. So I think what it, we need to look at is how do we educate people like by making it super applicable to something really fun that they're into. And, um, and it usually just comes down to really simple interactions, right? Or just like, you can play the game, you can win, but you won't win the reward if you don't have the 40 cards in your deck being NFTs. And you can play and you can unlock Battle Pass stuff, but if you don't, if you choose not to mint it at the end of the season, you know, you don't get, you know, you may not be able to trade it. So I think like highlighting the idea that you own the thing versus the thing dies with your account mm -hmm. is probably the opportunity. And I, I think some of that has maybe carried over from, you know, my other games I played as a kid. And yeah, that's kind of how we all ended up, you know, in, with building the way we built it. I think we just want it to be for everyone. Um, I don't think, I don't think blockchain should be like, and I know this is like maybe, maybe a little bit ideological, but like, I think, you know, the technology is really for everyone. I think anyone in the space can agree with that, but you know, I think to, to, to achieve that, I think you have to build it in a way that allows everyone to participate irrespective of their technical knowledge. Like the barrier to entry has to be zeroed out and then allow them to choose the path that they think is best for them. Mm -hmm. And and educate them along the way as to what the differences are. And I think that's such a key UX that people need to understand, like builders, is like blockchain doesn't have to do, you don't need blockchain for the entire game. Like you said, you can play the game. Blockchain just powers certain components. And we have a similar way that we run our product, which is Web3 Academy Pro, a newsletter. We have a premium version of it where you pay with it with normal credit card, it's processed through Stripe, and you get our premium content. But then if you want to attend events, events, you want to get like discounts and perks, you got to mint our NFT that's associated with that membership. And so again, it's like, you don't have to touch the blockchain to be a premium member of ours. But if you want the additional benefits, then you've got to mint it. And that's because that stuff's just not possible without minting something in your wallet. We can't do it with Stripe unless we like built out some ridiculous API, et cetera. And so it's just like, it onboards people in a way where it's just they have to have it in order to get those sort of benefits. So I absolutely love that. It's a really cool idea. I got a question. When building this, you talk a, a lot of people talk about gaming of how difficult it is to build a game, right? This is kind of why like DeFi has taken off way before Web3 Game is taking off. You can build a DeFi app pretty quickly. You don't need to worry about UX. It just needs to kind of function on a blockchain. Whereas for games to take off, you need it to function on a blockchain and you need it to be a good game, which is like probably not very easy. I assume I've never built a game, so I don't know. So I have two questions. One, can you talk to me about the timing? Like when did you guys start building Parallel? How long has that taken? And then just like, maybe you can touch on the Web3 side. Is it really slow to just build the game or is it really just hard to integrate blockchain into the game? And then is there like a lot of limitations and things currently with the technology that has like held you guys back? Or if you can just kind of touch on that a little bit, that'd be super helpful. Yeah, the the blockchain and smart contract side is like the easy part, actually. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I think um, obviously you've got to have a, a well-designed game. And again, that's credit to the game team and you want beautiful cards and that's credit to the art team. There's a lot of nuance, like especially with card games and, and making sure the mechanics of the game resolve correctly because there's so many permutations that are possible. Like this person played this card and that affects this card. And so I, I think I originally I was like, oh, you know, card games are probably easier was not right there at all. I thought that was the case. <laughs> I couldn't have been more wrong. And then that now we're going through this this kind of exercise where obviously we're in closed beta. We've got to prepare and, and figure out any issues in closed beta around bugs, around scalability of server side, which we've seen, and just like different things that you encounter. And like the 
they don't work the same way that the consumer mobile applications would work. And so you kind of have a new learning curve across the board, which is like the pre you know, the, the precondition to being even having a shot at this is having a fun game. Like, and that that's difficult in and of itself. But then you have all the technical differences. I don't think that the smart contract side is the difficult side at all. I think it's the games, you know, game side and particularly server side that's going to probably be the most interesting to learn and adjust and, and make the right changes. And then, but beyond that, I think, you know, the differentiating factor and the trick is how you implement it all, right? Like how you think about some of the stuff we were discussing earlier is like how you introduce this stuff to people and how you approach allowing everyone to play and how you approach dealing with a limited supply, a fixed supply of a card or a fixed supply of a token. Because fixed supplies and games that scale don't go well together, right? Like if you have something that only has, I'm just going to make an example, like a parallel card has 50, 50 a common card is 50,000 edition size. Any game with just 50,000 players is not a successful game. Like just, that's just that's the matter of fact in the traditional gaming world. But then if you only have 50,000 cards, how does it scale? And so you need to think about smart contracts and, and how you, you know, in our case, People who own cards can create more cards and they can do so with the ERC-20, the reward token prime. And we call those echoes. And But echoes can't make more echoes. Only the original cards can. And so like, how do you create a positive sum game or like a non-zero sum game where, you know, uh, the people who own the cards in the studio benefit together? So if the studio scales and a bunch of people come in and play, the players who own the cards are the ones who get to meet subsequent demand for cards. But like you have to solve that problem because if you don't, you're just going to have really expensive cards in mm -hmm. very small player base. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of, you have this like couple sets of problems. One is like make a good game and a great IP. And then you have like game specific technology that like you need to become very good at very quickly. And then you have, how does it all, how do these smart contracts integrate with it in a way that is logical and allows you to scale and allows you to realize full market potential. It's definitely different. I think I jokingly in the early days said, oh, this can't be like more than 20, 30% harder than building consumer applications. I was wrong. <laughs> and so, you know, but you just, as fast as you humanly can, you're always just trying to learn and adapt and uh, make changes to to get better as a team and to, to improve the, the game, the experience for everyone. It's so interesting. And I think we'll dive into the smart contract, not the technical side, but more the tokenomic side of, as you said, like how you manage supply and demand with both a ERC token where you need to ensure that people aren't just selling off your token and there's no, there needs to be enough utility and you've really thought that through. And so we'll get into that. Before we do, just want to go back to Kai's first question. How, how long have you guys been working on this for? When did you yes. start sure. the story or the world of Parallel? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the background and the lore. Sure. Yeah. So Parallel has been kind of a work in progress for the last two years. Like for context sake, right? I like to contextualize things the best I can based on traditional games is, you know, Hearthstone took about six years to make to get to close beta and they already had an existing IP. Parallel has done it, created the IP and created the closed beta game in two years. I think we've really started to, you know, took a hard look at how traditional studios make games and tried to innovate and find ways to improve that process. And I think we found efficiencies that otherwise wouldn't have been. And I think that the world and the story, right, is originally I just kind of was playing games with my friends and I came up with this kind of general narrative I thought was really compelling, which was like these five different groups of humans. There's, you know, a cataclysmic event on Earth. A large Hadron Collider has an incident. They're in search. Humans are in search of an infinite resource of energy source. It ends up having to create an ex it creates an exodus where everyone has to leave the planet. You know, the Marcolians, which stands for Mars colonists, colonize Mars. You've got the Augen Corps, who kind of uh, end up mining asteroid belts and kind of outer rings and to, to adjust to their lifestyle of harsh environment where they don't actually inhabit a planet. They start to augment themselves with technology, they become cybernetic almost. You've got the Cathari, who go on a deep space mission to Europa, the moon of Jupiter. And in that process, you know, lose the ability to bear children naturally. And so they decide to start cloning as a means of species survival. And so, and then you've got the Shroud who prior to this event, we sent our kind of brightest minds and scientists into deep space and they were sucked into a black hole and they meet this kind of thing that is not, not, not human, not from our dimension and come who they are. 
And so, and then you've got the earthen who are left on earth as in all stories, right? You've got this kind of group that's left behind and the earthen are changed, you know, in this maturation process of the earth becoming an energy source. And everyone detects this energy source and decides to return home to claim what's rightfully theirs is they're all human and they all believe it's their own planet. And obviously con- you know, conflict ensues when there's something of value between humans. So really, I think the story we wanted to tell was one of you know interstellar aspirations. I think that's super relevant. Planetary change, again, relevant and just human difference. So like three themes that we felt were relevant to today's zeitgeist and, and conversation. I think that came about also because we felt like a lot of the narratives from you know, big studios and IPs are starting to like hit like C string, D string storylines where we're not talking about the major story anymore. We're now like the subplot of the subplot of a character. And I have to say this is controversial, but like I always say this because like I do believe this to be true. It's like something comes after Star Wars, right? Like there's always something that there's more stories that the humans are going to, humans are going to tell about, you know, or even if they're fantastical and they're sci-fi, we have more stories to come and to tell that are different and compelling. And so uh, parallel wants to be exactly that, and so I think our goal is to continue to to develop the world and IP and develop the game and and the offerings, and that's kind of how it all came to be. And, and a bit about you know who all each of these parallels are. It's amazing. It's uh, not only is the story in the background so well developed, and it's incredible that you've built it in as you said a much shorter time than what other leaders in the space have done, but also. You've built this incredible community. How are you able to build this community before you even launched the game? And you sold, or I don't know if you sold them or if they were free, but you have 6 million NFTs, I believe is is the number. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's something like that. It's like 180 cards that are 1155, so they have addition sizes. Yeah. So I don't know the total number, probably like five and a half million, six million, sure. Yeah, we sold them. Yeah, we didn't. How did you do that before you even had a game? We just told people the honest truth, right? Like, I think like in a space at times where people are like super pumped and like excited and like, you should buy this. It's going to go to like that. Like, we don't do that. We're just like, hey, man, we're going to try and make this game. And like, we could fail. Maybe. Who knows? Right. Like, and it was really early. We were just honest, though. We're like, we have this idea for the game. Here's how we think it's going to work. Here's what the cards do in the game. Things are subject to change. Like, this was the conversation we had with anyone who was interested in what we were doing. If you want to support us, that's awesome. And we're going to do our very best to make a really good game. And people just decided to support us. I guess they could see that we were like actually going to make a real game. I don't know. We just took the approach of like, let's just be honest with everyone and tell them like, we haven't built this yet and we are working on it. And here's how we're going to approach it. And here's our goals and our aspirations for it. But like only do it if you feel like you actually really want to play this game or you think this these cards are something that you're into. And I think over time, right? Like we had our first PS15 was the it's called pre-sale 15 cards and sold 15 cards and that gave us just enough money to bring our artists in house and and let them keep working on the next set and then we had six pack drops uh, leading up to the game to kind of create the base set of cards and which are what you can find on OpenSea today and over time you know more and more people start to take an interest and see the art and i think that's a testament to the art team and start to see progress on the client that we we're working on and where we were going with it and realize that like, oh, these guys are actually working really hard to, to make something great. So I think over time, confidence just got built as we just continued to make progress irrespective of market conditions and what people were saying, if it was good or bad, it didn't matter. We were just going to keep going. And you know, then lo and behold, kind of you fast forward two years later, you like find yourself in closed beta of a game that people really like. It's funny though, because sometimes I think there's so many different things that are marketed to everyone in the space that like when someone actually does the thing that they say, it's a little bit like surprising. <laughs> right. How does come along with us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's essentially all we did is we just did the thing that we said we were do. <laughs> we still have a lot of work to do. Like, I don't like to celebrate it because like, you know, we're always trying to fix, there's always something breaking or something we have to fix and like something we have to adjust and we're constantly focused on, you know, what needs to be corrected in the short term, where are we going in the long term and let's invest in those two areas. We don't want this just to be for like, you know, a couple thousand people on the internet who are into crypto. This should just be something that everyone can play and it just solves a lot of problems and becomes like a bit of a thing that people can point to, which is like, yeah, but that game does it really well and look how it uses blockchain and and it's just, it makes sense. That's where we want to go. And we want, you know, the IP to be broadly distributed. Can you walk us through sort of where you guys are at now? And I mean, for those that aren't in the beta that aren't playing, kind of like what's possible in the game and then sort of 
I don't know, loose timelines of like where you plan to go from here. Or like, I guess what's next and feel free to, you know, not say whatever you don't need to say or don't want to say, but like walk us through, you know, whatever you can. No, no, ask the tough questions. Come on. Yeah. Come on everybody. <laughs> We, we try we try to be as transparent as we can without ruining surprises for people, right? But right. Um, so right now we're in closed beta. There's a couple thousand people playing and testing and finding bugs with us, and we're refining those problems and adjusting them. And the purpose of the closed beta is really to find what's not working, what's breaking, and remediate those issues. But in the beta right now, you can connect your wallet, save multiple wallets, and then use your cards to play the game. And each card, you know, different card type has a different visual treatment. So like special edition cards have like this foil finish versus first editions, which are more like Chrome looking PL cards, which are perfect loops are animated in the game and they have different effects. There's voiceovers, you can play matchmake with other people, play in, in kind of ranked mode, rookie mode. There's an onboarding tutorial. You can look at your collection, manage it. You have your renown, which is like XP at the card level. So there's all kinds of depth to the game and people are just beginning to explore that, like what that looks like. But really, the, the game right now it, it is primarily the path that people experience is they come in, they play Rookie Q, they learn how each of the five parallels works, and then it unlocks Rookie Ranked Mode, where you can get on a leaderboard and start earning Prime for beating other people. And the way that works is as you kind of build your decks in the game, you can set which cards you're using from your collection. So if you own NFTs, you can set NFTs, and that way you win when you do win, you earn Prime. Or you can just use apparition cards, which are non-NFT cards. You can buy non-NFT cards in the game, and those are called apparitions. You can open up packs in the game. So you could do a lot, right? Like it's the good, solid starting point. And on the game experience side, I think there's other areas architecturally where, where there's something to be desired. I think we want to focus on. But, and then I think what's coming is a number of more, you know, more bug fixes, more balancing changes and tournaments which is like a huge one so like the way rock we looked at like you know the industry and the market and said like who has the best intraday tournament structure and like we think rocket league is the example to look at you know multiple intraday tournaments you can kind of casually hop in play for an hour or two and then just like leave and not think about it again so we have you know tournaments coming cosmetics so paragons are your like hero characters on the field we have Paragon skins, custom Paragon emotes. We have a Planetfall expansion set, so 130, approximately 130 more cards to diversify the play pool so that you have different you know, strategies that are new and emergent. So we have a lot that we're going to be shipping on the TCG side between now and end of year. And like really all that's focused on is like two kind of communicated areas I'd communicate as like what we're actually doing is we're putting in the features and functionality that we believe to be very important for full full release. And we're trying to find everything that's breaking at scale and remediate those problems. And that way you've got like a finished game that is stable for full release. That is your objective. So it sounds like super practical and pragmatic and it is. It's just like, those are the things you want. You want like a good game that like is it's offering and you want a game that is stable and fast and, and secure. And so that's what we aspire to. <laughs> I love that. And we always, I mean, everyone's always talking about the app that's going to bring the next billion. And then I always laugh and go, there's no way that our tech is ready to bring in a billion users. And I'm curious if you were to open it up today and just like let that 200,000 or whatever is in the wait list or more come into the game, is it the blockchain side of things that would break? Like, would that work? Or where are the like limitations to scale at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the server side, I think we we're working on a couple of known right. bugs that would be the first thing to break. Like it's, right. it's breaking under current load at times. <laughs> so I think like that's where we're focused today. I, I believe the way everything is designed from a blockchain standpoint, be it like ecosystems, prime emissions, game syncs, all that, I think that is actually relatively sound. And obviously the load of that would be dependent on the networks that we reside on for those smart contracts. So, you know, most of our FE and SE cards are on Ethereum mainnet. Whereas the echoes reside on base. I think we're just going to see more and more capacity and throughput availability on L2s and L3s in the future. But like when you have like a couple hundred thousand people sign up to play a game, what you don't want is to just like open a floodgate, right? What you want to do is like progressively over time, open it more and more and find out if you have any issues or dependencies or problems because sometimes it's not even on your side sometimes it's like a partner right like you have some third-party service provider that's doing something and you're like oh that's breaking and so it's a bit of a process but i think like 
if you opened the floodgates today, would we be ready? I'd say no, because we're still in closed beta. I think when we're ready, we'll be when we're in open release. But do I think that like the space could handle a couple hundred thousand more players, you know, people collecting cards and interacting with the smart contract side? I don't see any issue with that outside of maybe having significant cost increase in gas fees. Yeah. Oh, is that a fair answer? It's a great answer. I also was going to ask which chains you were using and you answered those for me. So that's great too. <laughs> I guess follow up to that. Any specific reason you chose that tech stack, Ethereum plus, I mean, base, which just launched, but any like thing that led you towards that? Yeah, I mean, base from a cost standpoint is, is obviously one benefit to the player or the gamer. Um, but also like when you think about a bunch of new people coming in and you ask yourself like, okay, it's hard enough to build a good game, like just let alone try and solve the problem of making it easy for people to interact with blockchain for the first time. Like that's its own mega problem. And if you ask yourself like, who's the best at that? If you're like honest with yourself, the truth is, is the, the group that, or the company that's on done that the most or with the most success is Coinbase. And so why not work with a company that makes that their cornerstone and I can make my cornerstone the game. Mm-hmm. Like they're great at helping people come into the ecosystem. I'm great, great at introducing them to the ecosystem by a great game. And like, that's a good relationship. And so they're just also really good to work with and they're, they're super responsive and they've been nothing but supportive to us. So I think it just made sense for the emissions of our ERC-20 and for Echoes, which are the kind of cards you can replicate from your original cards for that to exist on base. And then, you know, for our pack drops in our, our FE cards, our SC cards and our PLs, so like our kind of first edition base set cards, those all exist on Ethereum. And I think like there's obviously like a history to Ethereum that is, you know, adds provenance to NFTs that are minted on it. So we view that as valuable. And just like, I've always been interested in, in Ethereum's, you know, Ethereum as a result of what's possible, what you can do with it from a smart contract standpoint, and just the number of people contributing to it. And, and that, from a contributor's standpoint, the, the one thing to think about, obviously, is that, you know, that comes with increased cost because more people are trying to do more things on this network. Generally, the idea is like, you know, you want to be where everyone is from, you know, your primary card issuance. And then you want to be in in an ecosystem that's specific for your game's operation for game specific functions, which are, and then like the, and the way we handle it's a little clever, right? Like all we do is we say, connect your wallet to parallel.life and sign a signature with your wallet. And we save the wallet to your profile. And then when you log in with your email and password on parallel's client, the game client, it just pulls everything in your wallet. And if you finish a game, it checks your wallet again to make sure you didn't sell something. So you can't use it if you don't have it anymore. And so like, I think we're trying to like do it as cleverly as we can and simply as we can base in Ethereum allow us to do that while also offering us a lot of flexibility from an EVM standpoint. You want EVM compatible networks, right? That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And so we'll get into the economics thing I think is, is coming, but also in terms of just like the UX of this, when you're selling, buying, trading any of these cards, is it, are you guys building your own marketplace? Do you already have one or is it you got to use OpenSea? Uh, but so yeah, you have to so, meet parallel and go into a different app to do that, or what's your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, so so right now the way it works is people can buy and sell cards on OpenSea, on PseudoSwap, on a bunch of different exchanges and the marketplaces. I, I should say, but the Echelon Prime Foundation, you can check out Echelon at Echelon.io, is the foundation that governs the ERC twenty Prime token. That's an elected member, elected members from the community that are put into place to represent the foundation and the Web3 gaming ecosystem manually. And they have a deliverable this year to, I believe it's this year, later this year, to launch a marketplace specifically for parallel cards and specifically for Prime. And so I think we've seen a number of different collections start to, you know, take a position on this whole like royalties, open C, blur. And we've been a little bit fortunate because parallel cards are 1155 and like a lot of mar- marketplaces don't support 1155. Mm-hmm. Um, so happy coincidence. Um, uh, but I think because this game is so unique in the way there's so many cards, right? Like it, it almost begs for a, a custom solution. And I think a foundation decided to go down that road with another development group that they work with called Chain Safe Systems. And chain safe systems are also worth looking up. I mean, they're like open source maintainers for Ethereum, Cosmos, Polkadot, I think all kinds of different groups, right? The foundation's working with them to build and deploy a marketplace specifically for parallel cards. That all exists outside of the game client itself, right? Now. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Prime, mentioning Prime. How is Prime used in the game? How do you earn Prime? 
Yeah. So the way you earn prime is the number of cards in your deck. So you, you have a 40 card deck and it's comprised of any one parallel and universal cards. You can mix universal cards in with any other parallel, but you can't mix parallels. So you get a bunch of Cathari cards, you get some universal cards, you've got a 40 card deck. When you have those cards in your, in your ownership of your wallet, you can set them in the game client. So you're like, I want to use this card, that card. You go play a game in ranked. If you win in ranked, you win in a mission of prime. And then you can take that and you can either you know, go to payload, which is like this kind of random gumball machine like thing for with cards in it. It's got like a million cards in it. You can just put some prime in and get some more cards. You can get your cards signed by the artists. There's something called a, an artograph, which is has a visual treatment in game, so you can get your cards signed. And those are like a kind of rare subset of cards. You can spend it to make an echo, which is again another card that you can use to fill out your deck, give to a friend, sell to someone else who needs cards. And then there's like things like cosmetics, right? That we have coming like Paragon skins, Paragon emotes that are only available in Prime. You can use Prime to vote on decisions and governance from the foundation side. There's a lot you could do already today. I think like 5% of the total supply of Prime has already been sunk, used by the community. So it's not like something that's everyone's just hoarding. People actually do use it. And so that's how you earn Prime and or, and or use Prime within the ecosystem. And what do you see as... In the future, when somebody wants to play and join the ecosystem, will they need to buy Prime to get in or will it more likely be play to earn? So every time Prime is sunk in the game, the vast majority of it goes back into the play to earn pool. And this comes down to this problem around a fixed supply token being emitted as a reward and eventually depleting your play to earn pool or becoming like, you know, hyperinflated. So every time someone spends Prime, the studio, Peril Studios, our side of the work, uh, keeps only 5% of that throughput. And the vast majority of it goes back into play to earn so that that pool is replenished and the circulating supply is kind of controlled. I, I think that if someone's coming in and never having played or heard of Parallel and they're like, someone tells them about it, they're just going to play the game for free. Mm -hmm. They're going to realize that if they did have cards, they could earn Prime. And they're going to make a decision one or two ways. They're going to say, I just want to buy a bunch of Prime so I can go and buy cards really quickly from Payload and start playing and earn more. Or they're going to say, I'm just going to go buy cards and with ether or with dollars and I'm going to, or maybe hit a, get a pack drop if the pack drops are happening at the time. And I'm just going to earn a little bit by bit until I get to where I want to be and I can get the skins I want. I think it depends on urgency. Like if you see a skin and you're like, oh, there's only five left, you're going to be like, I'm not going to risk it. I'm going to go take some ether, take some, some credit card and buy some prime or whatever you're going to do and get that skin so that I know I have it if, if it's urgent. And if it's not urgent, I think you're just going to feel like, okay, let's get some cards, let's play this game, and let's try it out. And if I earn some Prime, like over time, I'm going to be like, wow, I've accumulated some of this. And you're going to be like, what can I do with it? You're going to be able to use it on different things in the ecosystem. If we think of other games, the biggest problem, and you kind of touched on it, but I'd like to just dive a little bit deeper, but the biggest problem has always been the ERC-20 in the games, which end up getting inflated away, right? It's happened with Act Infinity. It's happened with Step In with, I don't know, a bunch of others. This is just kind of how it always goes. And so it sounds like what you're saying is um, people can buy Prime if they want to just like get quicker access into the game, like get cards and things like that. And then in terms of selling it, I guess, is it just that your emissions are very low? So they're not really making a lot of money. So to sell it doesn't make sense, but to use it for more in-game stuff does kind of make sense. How does that work when this opens up and people start playing this thing like crazy? H how do you like make sure that this token does not just get inflated away. I think you have to watch the data. No one should profess to have the answer to this. I think the data should be like your your barometer here. But I think the objective is to, as you have, you know, increasing players, you have increase, increasing emissions. And like the, the way it works is that the you have five games on a daily basis in ranked, their best five games get taken. And those are what you get from your emission on a daily basis. And it works out like, I think at 100% emissions on a daily basis, it works out to like 1.25 prime with like a full deck of NFTs, but no keys, which are like boosters to your your prime emissions. So the answer there is it's hard to get prime out of the game. Mm -hmm. right? right. Um, and, and, and then the second thing is like, what you want to do actually is, and this comes back to echoes, and this is going to get a little convoluted. I'm going to try to do my best to articulate this correctly, but Echoes have this uh, dynamic pricing structure where like if a first edition card costs, I'm just going to make up a number, okay, like a hundred bucks. Echoes, let's say to create an echo of that same card, because you, ha you have a first edition to replicate it, costs, I'm just going to say, uh, if it costs a, uh, a dollar to create a, a, for a first edition, it costs 40 cents, let's say, to create the echo. So 
when you go to create the echo, you're paying the 40 cents in prime, let's say, but you're subsidizing the cost of creating the card with time because you're playing games in the game and you're earning renown, which you need, which is like XP at the card level. You're earning this thing and you're spending both prime and renown to make this echo. So you've made an NFT now of the same card you own and you've paid 40 cents, let's say to make it. And every time someone makes the next card, it gets more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. So the optimal time for people to replicate cards to meet subsequent demand is when it's at floor or low. And essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a system whereby it's actually more economical to use a little bit of prime than sell prime to get liquidity. And you're trying to allow people to keep their cards so that because no one wants to sell their cards. If you have like a bunch of cards you like, you don't want to sell them. You want to sell replicated versions of them. Mm -hmm. And so how do you solve these two problems? And I think the answer is like what you create is a system whereby there's an incentive to regularly, consistently sync Prime as it's emitted. And the reason you do that is because it's cheapest when no one's making echoes. So if no one's making an echo of a card, it's at floor. You take that opportunity because you get it for cheapest, which gives you a better margin on your sale when you sell the card. So you're consistently having this syncing as you're consistently having this emission. And that gives you an incentive to make cards as your exit method method rather than sell the token because it's more efficient. And then it allows you as a byproduct to keep your cards, but still obtain liquidity. Right. So it's quite a nuanced thing that we have to watch once it's in production. But generally speaking, and I try to like share this stuff and tweet this stuff out because I want people to like, Think about it as well, right? Like, it's like it sounds logical, and it sounds like it makes sense. And obviously, the practical, you know, impl implementation of it is obviously where we'll find out the truth of the matter. But I feel like that way, when I share these ideas prior to just like doing them and deploying them, people can be like, "Actually, that doesn't make sense," right? Or pe people can say, "Okay, I thought about it as well. Have you considered this?" It's more of like an open way of thinking about it, right? How does it? What are your thoughts on? So at some point, basically what you're saying is that the sync, what you're saying is you're paying prime to basically make more of these trading cards and which makes sense as there's demand at yes. some point you reach a threshold where there's no new people coming in, whether that's at a hundred thousand, a million or a billion people. At some point, the game is going to kind of level out. Sure. Yeah. What happens at that point? Expansion sets. Okay. So you, what, you, what ends up happening is the tra tra train card games are so the total, totally great question, right? It's like, let's imagine you reach a hundred million players and we've tapped out every one of those people has cards from the out the base set of, they all have NFTs from the base set. Why would you make more NFTs from the base set? You probably wouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no more demand for them, but on a semi-annual basis on trading card games, and this is where they're unique is you issue expansion sets because games become stale if you don't issue new right hard to nice. evolve the game and so how do and then so if the addition size is the same as the previous edition size you still have now have this massive run on demand for all the expansion set cards to get replicated and then and the next expansion set and so it becomes a bit of like um like it, it is not like a clear perfect process like by any standard and i'm not professing to have the answer i'm just theorizing as to how i believe this should be solved but the answer is that like we have our first expansion set called the Planetfall, and that's scheduled to probably come out to the to market for pre-sale around October, and probably distributed and put into game around December, January. And that's 130 new cards, right? So, I think the answer is, and it's not like we're talking about echoes and card replication is like it's the only thing. It's not right. Like tournaments, tournaments sync prime every time you enter a tournament. A piece of that goes into the sync. If you buy Paragon skins, Paragon emotes, if you buy Glints, the in-game token, not, but not token, in-game currency, you can use Prime. And so there's a lot of different ways in which we can do this. But I think the, the interesting part about the Echoes and the reason I bring that up is just like there's an economic incentive to to do it when, to do it consistently at the lowest price. Hmm. Like It's like, let's say you do it and it's like a one hour interval. And then every hour you're going to probably do it to get as many of those cards as you can prior to the open release in theory, right? This is my theory. This is what I would do. I mean, just being like pragmatic, not pragmatic. Um, like if you're like taking a capitalist approach for a second, right? So yeah. like, I want to accumulate as many of these as I can prior to the open release so that when people do come in and want cards and the cards that are FE and SEs are too expensive, 
they can get a cheaper version, but I've already accumulated as many as possible, as cheaply as possible. Right? Right. Kind of logic says that that's the way to go. But that is not the only, it's just a good example because the emissions are often looked at as like this consistent stream of outfl uh, outflow of token. And how do you create a consistent inflow of token back into the ecosystem? And the answer is by offering an incentive to do so. And, and the only thing I can think of that creates consistency in that is, is echoes. But it doesn't mean that people won't like people spend tons on autographs, right? People spend tons on, which are just cosmetic. Mm -hmm. And like where people start to see some of the Paragon skins and the Paragon emotes, like, do you want a custom emote? Do you want a custom skin for your Paragon? Do you want a custom feel back? Like these are things that gamers tr traditionally spend on. So I think it really comes down to just making stuff people want. Like, <laughs> that's so simple, right? right? But like, yeah, I think the answer is like, I don't know if I'm right. I don't know. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know if we are right. Like the, the collective we as community, but I believe that we're doing things that are different, that are logical. And we're trying to gut check. I try to gut check them as much as I can so that I'm not like batshit crazy, believing that I have some solution that may not work. The thing is ultimately you can continue to update and be agile and make changes and add new syncs or burns or new expansions or whatever, as you learn more, like that's kind of, that's how all business works, right? You don't need all the answers from the beginning. I think you go in with a, a healthy, sober thesis, mm -hmm. right? And I think you try to like keyword sober, like, cause it's like easy to like see these things inflate and become really, you know, but I think you want to go in with a sober, healthy thesis, communicate that with everyone. So we're all on the same page as to how we think it works and, and, and then observe the data and communicate as to what you believe needs to change if so. And it should always be in the interest of sustainability of the ecosystem. If that, that's the goal, right? I think like games, businesses, and networks, they're all predicated when you're like, oh yeah, but like what happens when it stops scaling? Like all of them are predicated on scale. Everything we do as humans from a business standpoint, from a network standpoint, it's all predicated on scale. And like we see companies flatline when they, when they top out and then they, what they do is they end up starting to spend more on customer acquisition costs. So like grow their scale beyond the natural means. And so I think like the system we designed is predicated on scale. I think that is intentional, but that's why you see like, yeah, but you need people to want to play the game to want these echoes. And, but I think the leading indicator of whether or not we're, we're doing a good job at that today is, you know, the secondary value of first edition and second and first edition cards and the demand to get into the beta, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and those two indicators are positive, which means that maybe there is, maybe there is demand for people to be able to buy really cheap cards to play the game and earn prime, just like you can. Maybe not. I don't know. Right, <laughs> seems to be working so far, and all you can do is ship and adjust and change course. There is no secret to building great products. You just have to try, and some will work, and some won't, and you adjust yeah. as you go. I, I want to shift gears to Colony because yeah. you, well, you've talked about how you've been able to create this efficiency to build. Parallel TCG, which is the trading card game that's currently in closed beta that we've talked about so far in this episode. Somehow, at the same time, you are also building another game that is AI based. I have no idea how you're also doing that, but it feels like this is the, I, I, it feels like maybe more of your baby because it's the game that I think you most wanted to build and most wanted to play, but it's a little bit, it's a bigger objective. It also, from our end, we talked about when you released your avatars for Colony as it was the first time we had seen somebody really use 6551s yeah. in a use case, which we should explain that for our users who, or viewers who don't know what that is. But let's just take a step back. Tell us what is Colony and then we'll dive into the mechanics and the details of it. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll tell you about how this came to be. As we create cards... In the early days, like a happy accident that we found out was like the actual the artists were working in 3D and then flattening the image. That's how they work. Mm. And so one of the things we early on did was like, okay, let's refine those 3D. If it's like a, a good example is like a Lancer tank. If it's a Lancer tank, let's like take that 3D Lancer tank and refine it and make sure it's like a UE5 object that we could use. And like, it was just like future-proofing ourselves. It's like, how do we get the images off the cards? And 
So as we created this base set of cards, it almost acted as pre-production. And like I said earlier, you know, Hearthstone took six years and had the IP. Typically when you're creating an IP, you'd like spend time just creating the IP for a number of years and then integrate the IP into a game. We kind of had to like speed run it or do double duty here where we made the IP on the cards as pre-production. And then as we did that, we kind of built out this library of 3D objects and equipment. So it ranges from like guns, characters, vehicles, landscapes, all kinds of stuff. That started leading me, at, you know, as we started to look into UE5 and what was possible there, if we took this library, as we kind of we got pretty close to completing the base set, we're like, this library is pretty pretty chock full of some really, you know, interesting pieces of equipment and vehicles from the world. And like, what happens if we start putting it into UE5 and looking at what that might look like if we use this library to make more games? And so we experimented with that. We created maybe one or two demos in two days, just like taking characters, dropping them in, putting vehicles, putting guns in, like making a little bit of action out of it and saying like, is this where we want it to go? And I think what I concluded pretty early on was like, you know, I'm kind of known for saying this a bit is like, like if you think about like ARPGs, you think Diablo, right? Like if you think like it, there's, there's category leaders in these segments and like, you're always going to be second fiddle to the category leader. Whereas when we saw this kind of open AI's release in the scale at which it kind of grew, we we're like, this is an opportunity where if we integrate this correctly into a game and use these 3d object, this 3d object library to kind of make the game visually appealing, it could be a new category. And, you know, Koji or, or Mr. Gone likes to call it the game, a one and a half player game. Mm. And because the player is this AI character, you're not the player. It, you're like, it's devil or angel on its shoulder or it's coach. Yeah. And you're negotiating with it. Like, you can't just be like, go do this thing. I don't care. So a lot of times it'll be like, you're talking to me wrong. You don't think you're like, <laughs> and so, but it has its own. So it's it, the avatar is the character. It's a 721. And you'll probably have apparition versions just like you would, so like non NFT versions, so everyone can play. But the character has a six five five one wallet, so the the AI intelligence has digital possessions of its own that it's able to obtain from the simulation. Or you can literally just take ERC twenty Prime and drop it into its wallet. And it can go spend it with other AIs. It can go to the bar. It can buy beer. It can, and every time it creates something, it's emergent. So like if it might want to create something, uh, an example I always use is mint tea. One of the colonies went into this death spiral and the AI decided that the uh, the human told the AI, like, you know, when my oh, I'll upset my family says, have some mint tea, it'll make you feel better. So the AI decided to go plant mint in the garden, waited a couple of days for it to grow, picked it. When it picked it, an 11.55 of mint leaves was put into its wallet. It could have sold that to other AIs if it wanted. It would have a value. It then made, went to the kitchen, made tea out of it. It got a cup of tea in its wallet after the leaves were destroyed as an 11.55. And then it consumed it in the AI governance structure, which is called the Dungeon Master AI, gave it plus two, plus three, plus two happiness and plus two health for consuming it. And so it's like this entirely new paradigm and it's it's difficult to keep it on its rails. Like, so it's early, we did a pre-alpha with the public and I always tell people like, ask the public what they think, because that will be the best testament rather than me telling you. But essentially what I wanted to do was bring the world, breathe more life into the world, meaning like take it off of the cards. And we're going to continue to develop the TCG. That's our priority, obviously, but this is like our thing that we think is really meaningful and important to, to get right. And to do that, we took their 3D library that we've been accumulating as we built the base set of cards and used that to power this game in UE5. We're still in the process of, you know, most of the intelligence engines and, and systems we play with right now are in 2D, like this kind of like wireframe like version of the game, but we're hooking it up to the UE5 engine still. And the reason this got created was like, I was thinking about, well, one, the AI team was just like, the data engineering team had lots of experience in AI already. And they're like, we're going to do this. We're just going to show them. And first I was like, I don't really get it. Like, why would people like care? And then like, I started to play with it and I was like, this is groundbreaking. Yeah. But I looked, I started to like stop after I played with it for a couple of weeks with some of the, the team and then played with it, some of the public, I start kind of like stepped back and I was like, why is this so relevant? It, uh, to me, this is what I concluded was that like, okay. I'm turning 40 this year. I've spent my whole life playing games, but I don't have time to play three hours of Call of Duty anymore. Like, I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, like, the young people, like, they're going to break your ankles are so good. Yeah, yeah. Like, our reflexes aren't there anymore. It's not to say that these games are not enjoyable, but, like, I just can't play long-term. My life doesn't allow that. And then I also find no enjoyment in, like, 
mobile casual games. Like they're just, they don't do it for me. Like yeah. I can't go to dinner and be like, Hey, I had this great candy crush. <laughs> <laughs> so I think like what I concluded is we go from these like hardcore games. We grew up with games our whole lives. Now we're like this cohort of, of young men and young, or young men and or middle-aged men and women or whatever you want to call us. But like we have responsibilities. We can't play games for hours on end, but we still like games and we're going to probably play games the rest of our lives. So what is that going to look like? And what I concluded was like, we went from hardcore games like Call of Duty to like, and, and then to casual games. And we're likely going to go to this place of playing passive games where you have a relationship with this character. You're not the player. The, the world's constantly evolving. The world's, you know, your character's constantly changing. You're able to prompt that character and help them navigate the world. They're able to prompt you and tell you if they found something interesting. And, and there's scarcity in the simulation as a result of it being all assets being on chain and governed. And like, even the way it generates the assets is super interesting. And like the character decides it wants to make a space guitar. And this happened. But it asked the dungeon master, which governs the kind of like layer of the world that says like, if this is totally out of scope, like don't allow it. But it just breaks the illusion, right? And you don't want that. So it says, yeah, you know what? There's a bar. You could play space. You could play guitar, space guitar in the bar. It calls a trained version of stable diffusion that we've trained on our, or our own assets and mints generates the image of the 11 of the space guitar and then mints it on base and deposits it to the wallet and then that character can then decide the value of that guitar and sell it to another ai who can play it okay time out here time out so you're saying the ai comes up with an idea based on something that's happening in the game yeah and then it creates t or a guitar yeah and it's all AI that's deciding if this thing should be in the game or not. And then it mints it and there's no human interaction of this thing. Zero so human there interaction. Are, there are NFTs being minted on base right now, you're telling me, that are just part of a metaverse world, essentially is what this is, yeah. that is being led by AIs and they're just creating things like tees and guitars inside this game and it's all being minted on base. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so so in, in, in 48 hours, in 48 hours, the 15 people that were in the public test the AIs that they were interacting with did 3,200 transactions with each other and with the system. And they created things like one guy decided in the, we, you know, one of the, the people who was you know, interacting with his agent, his AI, his avatar, told him to make a, mi make a mixtape. And so it literally minted like a futuristic looking mixtape. And it even has the songs that the AI created from the mixtape. And they're actually like bangers. No way. <laughs> <laughs> So it, like it's this thing that is like I always try to tell people this, and it's like we're early. I don't want to like pro like we're trying our best to get to a consumer deliverable version close to the end of the year. It's all very unknown, but we're getting we're making really good progress. It's not like anything anyone's ever experienced. Mm -hmm. It's not a game that like you can point your finger at. Like the closest thing it's like to is like somewhere between a, having a dog, like a pet, right? Because you're like you care you end up caring about the character so much that you're yeah. like like some people still message me and say like. Make sure my character is still alive. Come on, man. Like you're calling it alive. But like once you play it, you're like, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's when you feel, when you get, like because some of the characters, you can kind of designate and create your character's persona when you set up the game. And so if you get in sync with your AI or your avatar, it starts to feel really good. And you're like, I've, I'm on the same page as, I'm on the wavelength with this character. I don't want this character to go away. And like they have memories. They're able to plan. They're able to create attributes to things like, it's really interesting. And I think, so you can expect to be able, we'll be doing another public alpha test, pre-alpha test, probably in the next couple of weeks. If you wanted to, you could open it up and like, it could swap tokens on, you know, on Uniswap. If you give the AI prime, it now has the ability to decide how to manage that prime. Uh, so could that prime, could it go to the bar and spend all that prime and now it's on? Yes. So that's happened where they drank them so silly. They, we, we've had that happen. We've had one guy was spamming the agent to tell him to do things. And then all of a sudden the agent just stopped what he was doing, went to the med, med bay and laid down. And then we asked him like, why are you in the med bay? And he says, there's a voice, there's voices in my head that won't stop. <laughs> wow. This is wild. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not your answer to the prime sync though, right? Is other games like this. Now they can use it as a currency in this world. So now there's more ways of using it outside of just, you know, to, to create new echo like NFTs. Right. So. Yeah, so like another way to contemplate this is like, okay, so there's a card called card called Supply Drop, and Supply Drop just like you can make an echo of a card, 
you could have it that people can pay a fee in Prime just like you could to make an echo of the card, to make an echo of the equipment on the card. And so now the supply drop card has this LAR rifle on it. It's like LAR rifle. And you could pay the same fee and compete with people who are creating cards to create equipment. And that same fee in Prime is sunk. And now you get a 3D piece of equipment of the rifle that you can then drop into your inventory of your character. Right? So like there's a lot, there's a lot of things that can get unpacked here. I try to be really careful about like not over promising here because it's like, it's so early and it's so nuanced, but it's like, I also try to point to people, other people who've played it to, to talk to them because it's like, they'll tell you, right. They'll tell you it's incredible, but like, we're not, I'm not certain yet that we'll be, you know, where we want to be um, because obviously we've got to work, make sure the TCG scales and is healthy and everything is good there. But we are, uh, like there is a dedicated team of resources specifically focused on developing this. And we do plan on having some pretty material progress before end of year. But like, because it's so emergent, it's hard to predict. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think in a few months time, as this becomes closer to reality, we got to get you back on and like, show us this thing. Yeah, sure. I, somehow, because this is just absolutely mind blowing. Jay, I'm not sure what else you have to wrap up, but I just have a question. One, how big is the Parallel team? It sounds like it's a pretty new company. You guys, I think you said about two years now. And I'm just curious, like how big? And then in terms of funding for this, did it all come from the Parallel NFTs? Like you had talked about, that's what allowed you to guys keep the artists on and that. Did all your funding come from there or do you guys have like backing from others? Yeah, so we're 55 people. That's internally. I mean, we probably have another 30 people supporting us externally, right? Who are right. developing auxiliary systems with us because like games are not built by just one little group. Obviously, we had six pack drops. Those are, you know, relatively successful for us, which is amazing. The community supported us, so thanks for that. And then we also had Chad Hurley, the founder of YouTube, is a, an investor and supporter of ours. You got, you got to tell the story of how you got him in. I just dropped him a note, right, and said like, "Hey, man, we're making this game, and it's like really cool. And like, here's some of the cards." And he's like, "I'm super into this." He's like, let's talk. And immediately he's like, I want to you know, be involved with you guys. And he's been in every meeting almost with us since we started this company. And been nothing but a champion and supporter. If you're ever considering interacting or, you know, he's just an amazing entrepreneur and the guy's a legend, right? right. So it's just amazing that you just DM'd him. Yeah. He responded and then became a lead investor. <laughs> yeah. It, well, and then he connected us with the open source fund. It was run by JJ, who's honestly, again, an incredible person who's just super supportive. And then Paradigm, again, you know, absolutely heroic. They invested 50, we did a $50 million round with them as leads. And so I think like we've had a great success on our own as a business selling cards, right? And we've also had a lot of people who came to support us to make it possible. Actually, I actually had one thing I wanted to say, if I can go back to Colony for a second, because it, it just struck me. You're saying, you know, hey, what happens if I gave a bunch of Prime and they can go drink it away? And there's another interesting example where Someone got clever because the way that people get ERC-20 Prime in the simulation, if you don't have any, is you tell your avatar, go to the mine, get raw minerals. R it has an RNG on what raw minerals you get out. You refine it and you turn it into the repository and you get an ERC-20 Prime for it. One person decided to tell the avatar to go to the mine, get raw minerals, go to the refinery, refine it into gemstones. And then once they got that refined minerals, it was like, look like a crystal. They then took it to the workstation and said, make it into necklaces. And they made it into necklaces and started selling it to other AIs and made more prime than they would have for turning in the gemstone for. But this AI is the entrepreneur. This guy's got yeah. it. He's like, oh yeah. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting stuff. But yeah. Anyway, so to come back to it. Yeah. The team's, the team's 55 people. They're amazing. I'm super fortunate to work with them. And the people who support us, both on the community and the investment side, are in, you know, nothing but kind and, and great with us. And so we have a lot, yeah, we have a lot to, to prove still and to deliver. Okay. I want to tell our audience how they can get involved. If people want to play Parallel TCG, obviously, I think everyone's going to want to play Colony. I know I'm super stoked on that whenever it comes out. How can people get involved? How can they get into? Yeah. Uh, the ecosystem. Yeah, they can just go to parallel.life and sign up for uh, the open release. There's also, also a, col a colony pre-registration site, I think. So you can sign up for that if you want, if you're really interested in colony. Yeah, I always recommend to people like play the game first, right? Like wait for us to get out of closed beta, you know, play the game, experience it. It's free to play. 
like get a sense of it and then decide if you want to like go off and, you know, get cards or get tokens or whatever you want to do. If you want to learn more about the token economy side of things and how that all works, I recommend checking out the foundation at echelon.io. You can follow us on Twitter at Parallel uh, TCG. I think that's probably the the starting point. And as we progressively open up, you know, as we you know resolve any issues we, we're navigating from a, a closed beta standpoint and move into open release, we're obviously going to begin to add people to the build in time and scale up. And so you'll have a chance to play just like everyone else and it'll be fun and you'll enjoy it. Amazing. Can't wait. Okay. Just a couple of fun speed round questions uh, before we wrap here. Uh, I'm just going to go with two questions today because we've already gone over time on this episode. First question, one thing you bought recently for under $100 that brings you joy does not have to be a digital good. Uh, I would say I have, I bought, um, it's a Casio watch. But it has the room. I don't know if you guys remember these. It has like a an infrared sensor on the front. It's from like the nineties, and like you can change the channel on television and stuff. Yeah, I remember that. I had that watch. <laughs> yeah. So all the cool kids in like high school had it, and they yeah. like turn off the TV on the yeah. TV this thing. They're like, "What happened?" <laughs> so I I came across one recently, and I was like, "Oh man!" Like I remember wanting one of those so bad. And it, like it it it's just like a simple little plastic watch, but. It does have a, an infrared TV remote on it. That's by the thing I bought recently for about it was like sixty eight bucks or something. And wait, is this from the nineties or is this? I have, yeah. I, you want to see it? I have it. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Like it's got the calculator too, right? It's also got the calculator yeah. on it. Yeah, that's a calculator. Yeah, I remember this. Oh, so you, uh, right. you see the infrared part on the top there, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm messing with your with your kids or with your wife and. Change yeah, the channel. Yeah. Just kind of like, I think it were one day, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. It was an impulse purchase, though. It was probably silly, but I, I like it. I think it's cool. It reminds me of like a time when technology was a little bit more analog. And I think what it does for me is it reminds me that like there are ways in which we can use technology that can create magical and kind of interesting moments. And I think like the first time I saw that, I was like, that watch has an infrared remote. I was like, like it's just a weird combination, but I was like, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think that's what it represents maybe to me is this like childlike uh, or youthful sense of watching technology evolve in a weird and obscure ways that like probably doesn't make a whole lot of practical sense, but is also like kind of cool. It's all, it's all that matters is it brings yeah. you away. Yeah. Okay, last question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? If I had a billboard... That one million people, one billion or one, one billion. billion. I always like how there's a difference. There's more yeah. pressure with a billion. <laughs> I probably just have like, I mean, I'm not going to use this on a personal like level. If it, there's a billion people they're going to see, I probably just have like a giant like parallel. Just say parallel, and then like the URL to parallel, and just a beautiful. I take ninety percent, like ninety nine percent of it would just be a gorgeous image created by the art team of you know a great battle or something that looks like. A renaissance painting and sci- a sci-fi renaissance painting that just says parallel <laughs> probably something simple like that because I, I, I feel bad having an opportunity like that presented to me and using it like for personal bullshit <laughs> <laughs> hey, your personal say. stuff isn't bullshit man oh i don't know why do you have you heard anything good <laughs> have you heard a good response to this that's interesting yeah every, you know what I, I would say it's pretty much split 40 percent take the marketing angle and promote their brand 60 percent probably take the more personal level and say a personal mantra be yeah. kind is the most common answer which is always refreshing and nice to hear that people think that we need to focus more on kindness and love for each other you also dropped a few in this episode that i was thinking that i might put on for you when you said just do what you say and that was your simple advice early yeah. on you know, so like, that's a good one. If you're a builder, like, don't be afraid to say it in public, but then you actually have to deliver on it. And you had another one that I can't remember right now. Oh, when you said you were talking about your products, you just said, business isn't hard, just make great products. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking, like, thank goodness it was me who did this interview and not Mr. Gone, because Mr. Gone's notorious for saying, send your ETH to Mr. Gone.e. So you probably just have a <laughs> giant poster of that. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that would be great. It's nice to hear people have really nice things to say to the world. I said that's, that's the question is, what do you want to say to the world? 
right? That's the question. I guess, I guess on a personal level, no pressure. There's no right, no right or wrong answer. I probably feel selfish using it for personal benefit. An opportunity like that came up to, to hit a billion people with a billboard. I'd probably use it for parallel. Well, no, no doubt your team and your entire community appreciate having a leader who is so relentlessly focused on building something <laughs> great. That's why you guys are, like, that's why we believe so much in what you're doing. It's so clear that you have this conviction to build something that goes way beyond what you, what exists right now, the way you're building a new category. The high fives, kudos to you and the whole team. It's really incredible. Can't wait to continue to watch the journey. Thanks so much for joining us today, Carlos. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. And if I can just say thank you to everyone who supported us along this journey to get to this point. And the journey's not done. We have lots to do, but I appreciate everyone who's been there for us. So thank you. And thank you to, for having me as well. Thanks so much for listening and everybody have an awesome day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.